Today's episode of In the Trenches is brought to you by System 12 Guitar Method. Sign up today at RyanRoxy.com. In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy. Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of In the Trenches. I am your host, Ryan Roxy. What is happening, folks? Our second show of the year. Couldn't be more excited about it. It's going to be a great one today. You know I love it when we get guitar players on. Well, we had guitar players on last week. Um, again, thanks to Nerd Halen for being on the show. If you haven't checked out that podcast, uh, make sure you do it. Where do you do it all? at uh, Ryan Roxy official on the YouTube channel. So uh, hit that subscribe button, hit that uh, helps us with the algorithm helps us get some eyeballs on these episodes. And uh, that's our goal this year is we're going to get a lot of eyeballs on a lot of these episodes. And how's your week been so far? I love it. Doing two in a row. Ugh, I'm ready. Uh, I know our guest is ready. Vic Chalfont is always ready. Uh, Federica is ready. Everyone's backstage. We were talking, having a little last before the show. And uh, we said, you know what? This is one of those family shows. Because like I said, um, well, I didn't say it yet. I'm going to have to give my intro first. Are you ready for that? First, make sure you sub like and subscribe. Get into our uh, live chat here that's in the YouTube official channel. Thank you very much if you're watching it on Facebook, or thank you very much if you are listening to it on uh, Apple Podcasts or Spotify. But you know what? We really want you here on the YouTube. Ready to go? Okay. Today on the podcast, our guest is not only a seasoned session player, but he has played a role in many of the world's most iconic bands. He's not just known for his guitar playing, but his legendary storytelling as well. From the Bee Gees to Twisted Sister, from Alice Cooper to Don Dawkin, from Winger to Whitesnake, he's worked with them all, including yours truly. That's true. Let's give a big hello and hear some of those unique stories with the first guitarist I ever teamed up with in the Alice Cooper band. Welcome into the trenches, Mr. Reb Beach. Hello, Reb. Hello, Ryan. How Thanks for having me. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> cool show. This is uh, just a great thing you got going here. Well, we used to be sponsored by Readers, uh, you know, Reader Glass and Company, uh, Clickware. <laughs> but uh, I think we should start going for some. <laughs> you said you tried contacts before, right? But it didn't work out for you. I spent like 300 bucks. I've got like, you know, 50 of them. And I couldn't get them in my eyes. Just sitting there. Just, it just wasn't happening. I tried all day long. I never have been able to understand the idea of contact. I don't like things touching uh, my eyeballs. I don't, yeah. you know, whenever you poke yourself in your eye, you're kind of uncomfortable. You have to do it on a daily and nightly basis. You have to take them out too. I, I, and I never understand the concept of how they, they stay. How do contacts even stay? They're like shaped like your eyeball, but some nights I'm not in the right <clears throat> way to uh, take something out of my eye, you know, <laughs> like after like, you know, 10 beers and you're just, oh, I really don't feel like doing this. Um, so, well, this is going to really, this is going to really cater our demographic. We're going to find out real quick if, if the algorithm completely <laughs> takes a dump, but uh, are you at uh, 2.0 at this point with the reader's strength or where are you at? Not there yet. Uh, what 1.5? Oh, huh? you're holding on. 175. 175. All right. Yeah, I know. I know. There's a lot of people out there in our <laughs> in our audience that are, you know, pushing 2.0. I'm I'm at 2.0. Maybe going a little bit. You know, yeah. but it's all right. You know what? For all you little young whippersnappers that are uh, coming tuning in to hear about guitar shredding and all that stuff, uh, it doesn't matter if you have reader glasses or not. You can do it. You can do it, and you'll get there someday. Let's start yes. from the beginning, folks. Reb, with Reb Beach, we have to, you know what? Go back to get forward or something like that. Okay. There you go. Did you cool. have a motorcycle? I had one when I was yeah. a kid. Um, you know, dad had I, lots of money. And so, it, it, you know, when I was young, he had lots of money. And so we got motorcycles, me and my brother. And then my brother... Like motocross, running. or did you actually have street bikes? No, they were little motocross bikes. bikes. Nice. And, uh, my brother was playing Indy 500 on this street, and it had like an embankment that went up, and one wheel went off and one wheel stayed on. And so the whole bike flipped. And I found him on the ground, and he broke both his wrists and his ribs. 
And so then um, my mom told me that my dad was going to take my motorcycle. So I borrowed some chains from friends and I chained, chained it to <clears throat> the, uh, the basement uh, pylon. And uh, dad hired some guys to come in and break all the chains. So I had to tell Is that where the song Breaking the Chains came in? Yeah. From, yeah. from Dawkins? <laughs> it must hold a lot of truth for you. <laughs> because like I said in the intro, you have played with them all. Uh, Dawkins being one of those bands. And uh, yeah, like your brother didn't, uh, he didn't grow up playing guitar. He didn't end up playing guitar. Or did he? Well, this is interesting. Um, my whole family most of my family got into the entertainment business. My brother is one of the foremost voice actors uh, in the country. He, he does like uh, tonight on CNN, Anderson Cooper talks about Donald Trump, you know, whatever. Um, he does in a world. He's like that in a world. voice. He, he's done a in few a world. worlds. You know, he does Subaru and all, all different kinds of commercials. My sister is a big time casting director uh, she did all the screen movies and, you know, wedding crashers and just, she's got a huge list. Uh, and then my brother was the director of the Metropolitan Opera for nine years. So it, it kind of runs in the family. So the beaches are entertainers for sure. Yeah. Yeah. In, in different facets of it. I, I've been told I've got a voice for ASMR. Look at you. <laughs> were, were you a, um, that's a great shot of Mr. Red Beach. Um were you, were you like a big hero of that? That wasn't Toy Story. I mean, that was before that. Toy Story, right? <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Um, I, I had a, I had a stage mother, and she was constantly pushing me um, to take tap lessons. I took ballet. She was always getting me up on stage for any production that they had in fifth grade. You know, I was think about the sun, Pippin. You know, I was on stage <laughs> singing. Um, all the time. So it really helped me later on that, you know, I have friends who have stage fright and I, I just feel so comfortable up there. And it's because I was on stage since I was a kid. So you've had two child experiences already in five minutes of doing the podcast that have maybe shaped your future with music and the musicians that you play with. One, your dad changed your motorcycle or you chained the motorcycle to the pylon so that you, you wouldn't get stolen, but your dad hired some people and that was breaking the chains to break the chains with Dawkin. And then your mom made you take or didn't make you or suggested or drove you there, whatever ballet lessons. And then who would have known you would meet up years later with another ballet uh, dancer in the form of one Kip winger. I no? knew a little bit about, about ballet when I met him and uh, you know, we discussed some of his moves for sure. Why did you not do double periods in the videos, man? That <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't have that have taken it over the top. That's cool for the bass player singer, but, you know, it's not a guitar thing. Bass player singer with a microphone oh, like that, you can play. Right. And it's cool. <laughs> You've never had that mic. You've never had the what I call it the Sammy Hagar mic, but I guess it should be the Kip Winger mic as well. What is that? Uh, Madonna mic. I, I don't know. Madonna. Mike? You're right. No, it is Sammy Hagar. I saw Sammy uh, open for Boston on that amazing tour, um, and uh, Red tour or something like that, right? It, Jimmy, man, he used to run back and forth. He was constantly running. He was like Angus. He was just cool. Yeah. I, it, it's it's such a uh, double-edged sword that the Madonna mic, the winger mic, the uh, Hagar mic, whatever you want to call it, um, because, yes, it solves all the problems for us guitar players that sing and still want to entertain and do this because as soon as you, you know this from, you know, playing in all your solo stuff, the minute you step away from the microphone, you're, you can't, you're kind of tied to it when you're fronting the band. I always have to run back. Sometimes I don't make it, you know, you have to time it perfectly. Like, Oh my God, here I go. I gotta get back to the mic. But you know, also those mics sound like crap. They still haven't perfected um, that. Uh, technology you hear that buyer dynamic maybe they should start working on a new signature uh we could call it well what would we call it it would be the new mic because who's using them now I, I, you know what dennis de young uh oh, really? in, in the trenches alumni I remember, even. <laughs> well it was it was more on the mr roboto tour as i remember those microphones you know yeah. 
And for people tuning in that just wanted to hear about guitars, who thought we would go on uh, lavalier mics, a whole, it's not even a lavalier mic. Who thought we'd talk so much about Madonna winger and Hagar mics? There's going to be a lot of different tangents here. I can tell we're, we're uh, 10 minutes into it. <laughs> well, Dennis DeYoung, Mike, I think, Den I, I, you know what? I'll give Dennis DeYoung. We love him. He was a great guest. Um, but so you're growing up. I want to say you grew up in the Pittsburgh area. I did. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I did. Um, but <clears throat> both of my parents were having affairs, so they sent all the kids away to school. <laughs> um, I went to uh, the... Why not just uh, start a commune? Yeah, yeah. and I, I went to the Lake... What, what was it called? It was called the North Country School in Lake Placid, New York. And then I went to the Putney School <laughs> in Putney um, in Vermont. Went there for a couple years. Uh, I went there with uh, Oliver Lieber uh, of Lieber and Stoller. He played with Rod Stewart for a while, um, right. great guy. And uh, yeah, so I went away to schools, and then you know to we facilitate had... your parents' uh, affairs. That's oh, yeah. very what a good yeah. son you were. Yeah, what all a good of us, <laughs> all of us and, and summer camp. I went to summer camp for seven years. Okay, um, sailing camp though. I became quite the sailor. I won some races. Uh, but anyway, sailing camp. That yeah. is that sounds that sounds like something you would do. It, while taking ballet lessons, sailing camp, it does sound like something very, I mean, it goes along the lines of your cowboy outfit that you had on earlier. Yeah, um, they want us to be the Kennedy kids, you know, they want us to dress like the Kennedy kids back then. <laughs> um, but we, uh, we would vacation in Florida. They had a condo in Florida and I met a guy who played in the band and their guitar player, they didn't like their guitar player. So um, they asked me if I wanted to move to Florida. And uh, that was just after that, wow, when I had the Rick Springfield haircut. I had just got to New York. Um, you do look like a working class dog right there. Uh, folks, look, go back to that picture real quick there, Vic, if you can show that. I love that uh, that look. Uh, you know, you you had a very rock and roll mullet. That was the pretty much the standard issue haircut back in those days. What's the shirt you're wearing? Pris Prisma Recording Studios is where we recorded... Uh, thing you know it was a nice recording studio big one now was that when you first picked up the guitar was back in those days or or how did you meet this guy and and he said oh we don't like really like our guitar player but you know we want you to do it did you know you have any knowledge of it at that point had you been dabbling with it yeah i started playing when i was 13 i saw kiss and that was it i, I it just came to me oh well there it is that's what i'm gonna be that's what i'm gonna do where did you um, see him uh, I saw him at Madison Square Garden when I was going to school in Lake Placid. My brother, the director of the opera, said, hey, there's this band called Kiss. It sounds like it's your kind of music. And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> and uh, he took me to see them on the one day off that I had from school. And then years later, of course, Vic, our, our, our illustrious producer, has just put up the, uh, I guess that would be the lam laminate for the huge tour of Kiss, Winger, and Slaughter. So yeah, dreams yeah, come true. Great. But they didn't have the makeup on, which bummed me out. They're but when really you saw them the first time, they did. Oh, yeah. That was 76, I think. And when I saw them just the last time, just a couple months ago in Vienna, they they were doing it just just like they were back in the day. To be honest, sure, I love it. I saw the show uh, last year. It was wonderful, really yeah. good. Yeah. yeah. Um. Anyway. Uh, um. I so that was the band that turned you on. That that was the band that inspired you to say, "Yeah, let's let's play some music." Because we do have a little section a little bit later, Reb, if you don't mind, that the. Uh, the fans of yours have been writing me and inundating myself and Federica and Vic. They've been DMing us and they had some questions. We call that let the people speak. So every once in a while, if one of those questions might get ticked off the list, I will, uh, I will give credit where credit's due. But yeah, that was a lot of people wondered like, what was the band that did it for you? Um, yeah. And now we can say it's well, it was a band called fortune and we were one of the bigger bands in the circuit. There was another band called, uh, Queen or Little Queen or something. They were two twin girls who sang their asses off. Um, but this we is down were, in Florida. Yeah, in Florida, you know, uh, South Florida would be the house band at Summers on the Beach for a week, and then we'd be the house band at Art Stock's Playpen for a couple of weeks. And um, you know, there was all these clubs that uh, we would 
just be the house band at for a week. And I mean, it was the best time of my life. But I was playing jump on the keyboards every night and you know, it was all just covers <laughs> and I wanted more. I, I wanted more. And so I told them that I was going to go to New York City. Um, I my mother again, my mother met this manager guy who was a manager and said he'd manage me. <laughs> manager guy who was a manager said he would yeah. manage you. That yeah, covers all the bases. <laughs> well, it turns out that he was gay and he just wanted a cute little kid to walk around with. But. He introduced me to Clive Davis and all these famous people and actually got me started, um, you know, meeting people in the music business. Networking. Yeah, networking. Um, But but so I moved to New York City uh, with a guy I knew. He let me room with him um, and I got a job as a singing waiter in the Bowery um, down, you know, way downtown. And uh, right next to CB. What year was this? Because I'm wondering if it was the same time when I was living there. Was it late 80s? Or okay, it was right before I went there. Yeah. yeah. And what so, would you what would you do as a singing waiter? I'm just curious. Like, like yeah. what would you like to eat? What would you like to eat? <laughs> yeah, no, it was kind of like that. Um, because all of the other singing waiters were Broadway wannabes, and most of them were gay, and they loved me because I couldn't handle more than two tables. So, you know, each guy got four tables and I always gave my other two to the other guys. Um, and they would sing show tunes, you know, cats and, you know, all this stuff. You were and more I, of a selective singer. I would sing Elton John and Billy Joel and I kicked the piano player out because he sucked and I would just play, you know, uh, Elton John and, and my two songs that I knew. Oh, there's me on Elton John's piano, which was really something that's, that's amazing. That's actual Elton John's piano and you. Yeah, yeah it is. And what's interesting about that is that there's a... Uh, um, what do they call it? A lyric sheet um, mm-hmm. electronic that's on the piano. You can see it. It's under glass. And so everything that he's, all the lyrics are on there just scrolling. He's got a lot of lyrics, time. man. He's got a lot of lyrics, but really is that, is that something that you think is his own invention or is that something that Yamaha does for, you know, with all their pianos? I, I don't, I, Oh no, no, no. This was something I'd never heard of or seen before. It was a prompter, a teleprompter. Is yeah. But, but, but like a piano prompter, it's, it was in, through the glass of the, pi- yeah, of the, piano, That's cool. the piano built into the piano. Super nice. Cool. Nice. And you didn't yell at his, uh, you didn't yell at his monitor man or anything like that. It's <laughs> that's going around that little, that little meme right now of, of Elton, just like, you know, he said he's very, very cordial at the, fir- at the first time, but then he's, you know, getting mad oh. at his monitor guy. Oh, no, you, you, you've had, I mean, come on, you've had your share of, of lead singers that have sort of maybe lost it with the monitor man once in a while. Oh man. Kip has totally lost it before. I mean, not like Don, Don is the ultimate, you know, guy to really berate his monitor guy. But, but, uh, Kip a few times has told the monitor guy, you know, to, to quit, you know, you should not. I be really want to appreciate if you just quit. If you <laughs> oh can't, my God. If you can't work the- <laughs> Don't quit your day job. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. the whole what thing. what came first reb for you was it the guitar or the piano piano oh yeah I, I started on piano my parents thought that i was a child prodigy and it turns out that i wasn't i, I just had a really good <laughs> you're I just, just really cute you can just really pull off that rick springfield haircut <laughs> yeah oh hell yeah um but no, no, I had a really good ear. You know, uh, Mannix was on television. It was a show called Mannix. I remember Mannix, yeah. yeah it was like Columbo or something. And it had mm-hmm. a great uh, intro. And I was four years old and went up to the piano and just started playing it. And they were like, oh, my God, he's a prodigy. And it turns out, no, 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 no. He just has a really good ear. Um, and they so- had all those, all those TV shows back then had amazing uh, theme songs. Rockford Files. How great was that one? Johnny Quest was my favorite. Was it Johnny Quest? Okay. It was like jazz, you know, like a big band. I liked Mod Squad. I liked I liked the uh, theme song to Mod Squad because it had a. I think it's it's probably been sampled in a million rap albums at this point, but it's a it was a cool, cool. About the Mod Squad. Yeah, man. And then of course the uh, the uh, theme song to Too Close for Comfort. Who can forget that? (laughs) <laughs> too close for comfort the new alice cooper tour coming out in 2023 starts in april if you'd like to see that 
See that shameless plug, Vic? You should have those tour dates ready, buddy. I know. I just threw that on you. But yeah, we call we're calling the tour. Uh, we're going to talk about me and you playing that first year of uh, Alice oh, Cooper yes. for both of us. But yeah, he, he's, can you believe it? Since that year, Reb, you know, I've I've done some years uh, where I, I didn't play with Alice. I, I actually, you know, didn't play the whole time. Didn't tour with Alice the whole time. I first moved to Sweden and I was here and you were playing with, a dip, you know, this band and that band and the other ever since 96, when we first joined, Alice has not taken a year off since that year. Isn't that something he's toured every fucking year. Is that you know, insane? It's, it is insane uh, that he can work like that. You know, he's just a workaholic. It's, it's unreal. And he plays golf every day as well. Every day. I know day. that I, I finally play golf now. I mean, that's the one thing back in those days when we were playing together. Um, I think we were just kind of just still living in the moment of, of, Hey man, we're in a big rock band. So let's just sleep all day or whatever. It wasn't like, I didn't catch the golf bug at that yeah. point. Did you ever, I mean, being a, you know, a, a Kennedy kid protege, didn't you well, never learn golf or was it badminton? My father was a big wig at Oakmont Country Club, which is right up the street. I played there. Very, yeah. very cool. Oakmont's a you know one it's of a big it's a it's a bucket list course. Yeah, no yeah, doubt. yeah, yeah. And I live in Oakmont. And my brother, my dad, wrote this book, Golf: The Body, the Mind, and the Game. And uh, it got published by Random House, and it's it's actually supposed to be amazing. Yeah, I've got to read I, it one day. I, I mean, I remember your dad. I remember I, I, more than more than remembering your dad. I you know, great man. I remember Dick the Beach. stories. Dick Beach. <laughs> Sounds like Dick. a gay resort. <laughs> Honestly, the stories of Dick Beach on our bus during mm. the poker games, Alice still to this day will be on the bus. He'll go, remember those stories Rep would talk about his, his father? And then there was this, the one story, because it goes back to it, it was about the dog. <laughs> oh, yeah. We, we're not going into that one. <laughs> I'm sure you've brought it up before in a different in, in, in a bunch of different contexts, but this is the thing, folks. This is what I'm telling you about. Reb has a story about almost everything in the world, and I love <laughs> myself and Alice Cooper included. Uh, we love your stories. We really oh, do. Thanks, Brian. So, I remember. Oh, well, I can talk about Alice later, but I mean, um, let's Alice talk about it now because you know what? There is really no no quick format because this is one of those things where we can just talk about whatever we want. I was sitting with Alice in the front of the bus and um, we were going across this big major highway and I saw a squirrel go across a power line that ran across the double highway. And I said, so that's how they do that. <laughs> and Alice did this typical Alice where he just, <laughs> just stared at me, you know? And then he told me that story the last time I saw him. He said, do you remember when you said that thing about the squirrel? Um, you know, but I mean, I got a great Alice story. Uh, I'll, I'll real quick. I'll try and quicken it up here. No, no, it's um, great. Do you take your time? That's the beauty of being on YouTube. There is no off button. We can just chill. Well, um, you know, Alice was like a father to me, you know, and he taught me how to play poker. Um, he really was so wise and he told the best stories of anyone on the planet. No. Um, but you know, you, you ha had to be respectful and I was pretty sure we weren't allowed to smoke marijuana at that time. And so I never really did um, on that tour, but I, I was outside the bus. We were getting ready to get on the bus to go to the next town. And this kid said, Hey, you want to smoke a joint? And I was like, man, I haven't smoked a joint in a long time. That would be fun. So I smoked a joint with the kid and this stuff was like acid or something. It was like crack, <laughs> you know, and I got on the bus and I'm like, oh my God, I'm stoned on the Alice Cooper bus. I am so stoned. It's like so weed I, is today, back <laughs> there in the 90s. It's like oh God, yeah. it's going into a dispensary today. I was super paranoid. And, you know, we played cards every night. Yes, we And did. I just was not up for it. So I went in the back and I hid just in the back thing, you know, and, and Alice was like, Hey, Reb, we need another guy. I was like, sorry, no, I can't do it tonight. You know? Um, and he said, come on, come on. So usually I won cause I was pretty good. Uh, and, uh, that yeah. night I lost. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 
<laughs> you have to remember, I was in the band too. We used okay. to call you, we didn't used to call you so much, but it was more Big John, Alice's security guy at that point. And I love Big John, uh, but we used to call him the ATM because he was always good for 20 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> he comes sit at the table and it'd be 20 bucks. We had a game called ATM. It was a uh, five card, just all up. But yes. the, anyway, the moral of the story um, is that uh, I lost 50 bucks in the game. Because and, you were it, Yeah, and I, I told, I was telling Alice that I was tired. I'm just really tired, Alice, you know. And the next morning I woke up and there was $50 under my pillow. And I said, Alice, you put you put money under my pillow. And he said, well, you were tired. He ah. knew I was going. You know? <laughs> and he was cool about it. That so, is amazing. Yeah. So... We we, I did not know that story. The question is now: Who did he take that fifty bucks from? <laughs> Had to have been Big John because yeah, he, he did, you know, like like because he, 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 he would he would he won all the time. Alice was the big winner. Every always, day. always. And and here's the thing, Alice. There was a question that came up in the ch in the chat in the in the comments just earlier, and they said, "Is Alice as good of a golfer as as everyone says he is?" Actually, folks, he's as good of a golfer and he's good as as good of a um, uh, poker player, and he's as great as a front man I think as you'll ever find like out there. He's like you know you bar none. He's the one guy that's out there that's that's still giving it. 110 percent plus he plays his schedule you know i know because we're on the bus together we're playing four five shows a night still so it's, it's or five shows a week amazing, he's this amazing person like as soon as anyone meets alice they feel comfortable yeah. he just makes everyone feel comfortable um you just talked about that last week how these uh, the household names the the sort of household name guys make mm -hmm. you feel like you're the most special guy in the room and make you feel more like you're the rock star instead of them. Hmm. That's so that's true with Alice for sure. And I'm yeah. sure that the, the, the contrary is for some other guys because a lot of it's ego. And sometimes, you know, you you're jamming with people that uh, aren't as. Oh yeah. That way. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of musicians in this business, you know, think that they're just the greatest, you know, and have that attitude and, um, they don't, you know, they don't go as far as the people who are easy to work with. You know, they get the calls. Was that your sort of secret sauce? Was that your a special superpower able to get along with people back in those? Cause, cause you started the session gig pretty early as well, because I just put up the post with you on that BG song. Yeah. And, I mean, um. Please don't 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 we, tell me that the Bee Gees were 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 uh, egomaniacs. Tell me they were the coolest guys. Oh, the coolest yeah. guys ever, and all of them smoked weed. Every <laughs> single one of them, and they There's smoked weed right there all day, all day from morning till night. I walked in their studio at the. Uh, they put me up at the Doral, and their studio was uh, right near the beach in Miami. Um, you walk in, and there's just bags of weed everywhere. <laughs> They, they all. It's my. There's probably bags of other stuff too. <laughs> but they, you know, uh, uh, they didn't have a vocal on this one track they wanted me to play on, so they wanted me to hear the vocal so I could, you know, know what it was to uh, use it in the melody, and um, so they all got around me and sang, uh, you know, ha, 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 you know that with that thing, and it was all it was perfect pitch, you know, none of them went like, ah, oh, what? Give me an A, you know, no, they just knew the pitch. Uh, oh. And to have those iconic vocals circle me and sing live was uh, one of the greatest experiences of my life. Um, but I'll tell you I how I got started yeah. Yeah. doing yeah. sessions. Um, uh, I heard about an audition for Fiona when I was the singing waiter, uh, Fiona. And I heard about it at like Guitar Center or something. Um, and so I went out there to the audition in Long Island, took the train way out there. And I walk in. And there's all these guys in spandex with teased out hair. You know, I've got my hoodie on and, you know, my jeans. And um, I walk into the audition at Joe Franco on drums. And uh, they're like, if you can play guitar, you got the gig. Because these guys with the teased <laughs> hair and the freaking, you know. You're like, you're like, yeah, yeah. I think I got the gig. No, it wasn't that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, so I go to do the thing, uh, Fiona's record, and it was Bo Hill producing. And I did the whole album, tons of guitar. It took me over a week. 
Um, and you Fiona's said, okay, been easy on the eyes. If I, if I remember correctly, oh, Fiona was pretty, 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 is, pretty good looking. is gorgeous. Really, really yeah. gorgeous. Yeah. And um, yeah, so, guys. so he said, I, I don't want to insult you, Reb. It's time to pay you. How does 500 bucks sound? I was like, 500 bucks? Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. It's, it's more than I'm making a singing waiter anywhere. <laughs> it should have been more like 5,000. But Bo told everyone, all the producers, everyone at Atlantic Studios, hey, I got this kid, plays great, nice guy, easy to work with, and he'll do it for 500 bucks. So I did the Bee Gees, Howard Jones, Shaka Khan, Roger Daltrey. I was just started, you know, because okay, I was okay. cheap. Then I got in the union and, um, and then you realized how much you had lost, <laughs> how much oh, money yeah. you had lost. But you got Ow. to play, you got to play on all those amazing tracks, and all, you know, also Fiona, vocal talent. Did did she ask you to go on tour with her, or did, what no, happened? She put me, she put me in a movie, and it was the what? worst movie ever made, the what? worst movie ever made. It was directed by Richard Marquand, who uh, directed Return of the Jedi. But um, so, how, what movie did he make? Up? When, when the movie came out, Richard Marquand was murdered in his apartment, maybe because this movie is the worst movie ever made. It's called Hearts of Fire. And I'm in the movie with that haircut, with that, uh, what's it called, a mullet? Yes. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in Bob Dylan's band. And, you know, Bob Dylan came onto the stage for the, you know, to film a scene. And it was like 10 in the morning and he had a bottle of Jim Bean. <laughs> he walked right by me. You know, there's mm -hmm. going. And he picks up a guitar with a Floyd Rose on it and it's completely out of tune. So he, uh, let me tune this thing. And so he goes to tune it and he's That's tuning it and nothing's happening. You know, oh. and you would think he would hear that nothing's happening. He's playing the string, ding, 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 and turning the tuning peg. And it's not, the sound is not changing. So I said, excuse me, Mr. Dylan, uh, my name's Reb. Uh, that's a Floyd Rose. That's a whammy bar. And so you got to, you know, tune it from back. And uh, these newfangled things. <laughs> he took it off and he put on another guitar and we played, let's jam the blues. And we played the blues. So the next morning I'm eating breakfast and I hear this, hey, whammy bar. We're going to jam the blues again today. You know, hey, whammy so, bar. so he called me whammy bar for a week. <laughs> Now I want to open up a bar. Called You've been called bar. worse, Reb. I've been <laughs> called worse. But Whammy Bar is pretty fucking cool. You got a nickname from Bob Dylan. <laughs> from Bob Dylan, I did. Wow. And where was Fiona? How did she fit into this whole movie? She, it was her acting with Bob Dylan in the movie. Um, you know, you can see it on YouTube. You can see me with the mullet, you know, playing with Bob Dylan. Um, but, you know, paid me like five grand. And so that was really a great Price thing. Up. Never, you know, that's, a, that's about, uh, that's about, if I'm doing the math correctly, that's about 10, that's about 10 sessions, right? Uh, yeah. There it is. <laughs> Hearts of Fire, man. There it is. So that yeah. was the last movie that this director ever made. Oh, I see Bo Hill's name is there as well. Music a lot director. of it's produced by Kip Winger as well. Kip played all the bass and, was that, um, did you know Kip by at this point? Or had yeah, we hated him? each other. Really? Not, oh, yeah. It, it, what a great it, relationship. It, what, what, a, what an icebreaker. What was, the, what was the first meeting between the two of you, you know, after you're doing Bee Gees? And on, honestly, I, I saw uh, the list of names of the sessions that you were doing as well. Chaka Khan, Howard Jones, Twisted Sister, um, you know, Roger Daltrey, but what's this first one-on-one -on -one meeting with uh, Kip Winger? What, what happens there? Uh, it, it may have been Hearts of Fire, um, but you know he was always hanging around because we were Bo's A team. So uh, when Bo needed a bass player, uh, he'd call Kip, and when he needed a guitar, he'd call me. And so we would bump into each other uh, in the you know in the little green room. Okay. Um, and we talk a little bit and, you know, it just with his voice like this. And, and I just thought he was just so full of himself. And he thought I was full of myself because I had a Reb on my guitar. It said Reb because <laughs> uh, when I was in Fortune, this girl who liked the band was a painter. And she said, I'll paint your name on there. I'm like, oh, that's cool. And she did a really good job with like flowers and stuff that looked cool. No, not flowers. I guess they were vines. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mine sounds so, uh, super reb. I love yeah. it. So, so I told that to Kip. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, a fan did that for me. He was like, oh, a yeah, fan. Yeah, a fan. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we hated each other. Well, if you but go then, back to the picture of the two of you guys, uh, you know, because Vic, I've, I've been, 
I've talked enough about Fiona. I thought you'd find at least one photo of Fiona to put up there, but I guess that that ship has sailed. So now we have pictures of uh, Reb and and of course Kip. If you put that picture up, there's a lot of hair going on. I'm telling you, everywhere. I'm talking about it's arm hair, hair, chest hair, hair hair. I wasn't See, hairy. I was hairy. Yeah. Well, you had a lot of. You had a very nice head of hair. Oh, yeah, my head of hair was great. I, I'd wake up in the morning and it would be like that, basically. It was just a perm. But I mean, I guess if I got a perm, it might still look like that. Did you have a perm? Oh, yeah, big I time. Okay. I, I I mean, you sat in, you actually sat in the beautician's uh, oh, yeah. chair with, with those little curlers. Yeah. I, I did that too really early on. I did it like <laughs> super early on. Like, like I think it was seventh grade. I got my first perm and like, people are like, why would you get a perm when everybody wants? Cause I, cause I, I wanted to have the same hair as well. Look, you did have that sort of similar hair. But I wanted the same haircut as Peter Frampton on Frampton Comes Alive well, there you on that go. album cover. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, was it a little curly? Or, I mean, that was really curly, wasn't it? His was, was like, just kind of rock and roll curly, and it was kind of purple, but that was the light. So I, I, you know, I, I made my hair purple, and I tried to get a perm, and that worked out. You know, for, for a kid that's half Mexican, that did not go over great. Oh, right. Okay. You know, well, but whatever, it worked out. You, 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 you know. I, so, going on, moving on, folks. You want to hear about my perm all day, but uh, let's talk more about Reb and his perm. Um, here's a question that I have: How do you go from being a session musician to being a sort of guitar shredding god? <laughs> right. <laughs> um. I'll tell you, I was doing a session for Kenny Loggins and we worked on it all day and it was really good. Came out super cool. And so Kenny came in and he said, no, not going to happen. And he started, he went out and said, play your guitar. And I played my guitar and he started messing with the knobs. He said, all right, do the whole thing again and do it with this sound. And basically it wasn't as good. Um, and that made me go, you know what? I hate doing sessions. And, uh, and that's when Bo said, why don't you get together with Kip Winger? And um, so we did it. And in one day, we wrote, uh, uh, let's see, Madeleine, 17, Time to Surrender in one day. No, sorry. Yeah, Madeleine, 17, Time to Surrender, we wrote in one day. And yeah. that was it. I, I remember going back to my apartment in Hoboken and just going like, I've just met the most amazing musician. I, I just loved him from then on. Um, yeah. and, uh, yeah. So you're living in Hoboken, Jersey. Yeah, I was yeah, in Bo's apartment. Oh, um, nice. yeah. And then, so I was doing Kip, everyone back then. Right. I mean, I remember him doing the kicks record. Warrant, Warrant. Rat and Warrant were his big ones. Did you ever play on any of those albums and ghost as a ghost player? No, everyone thinks I did. It wasn't me. It was Mike Slamer, who was a very good guitar player. Um, it was before that was before I got into his a team thing. Okay. Um, but I did do the Twisted Sister thing, which was great. What an experience. I got to write with uh, with Dee Schneider for, I don't know, we worked together for like four or five months. Yeah. And, you know, I wrote sections on the record with him. And he is the funniest man I've ever met in my whole life. I My stomach would hurt every day from laughing from this guy. <laughs> I just got such a kick out of him. What a talent. And, and it has the same working work ethic and drive as Alice. I, when I see those two guys together and when we've toured together with Twisted Sister, there is this sort of, it's not, I wouldn't even say it's competitive because it's all individual, but they, they really, really go for it every single night. And to this day, it doesn't matter how old D Schneider, I don't even know how old D Schneider is. He's still the youngest guy in the, uh, in, in the venue. And he's still the guy that's, that's given it, the the most I've ever seen of a front man. And I have bad nights. Do you ever have a bad night where you're just in, it, where yeah. it sounds like crap? You can't yeah. hear this or that, you know, and it's just no fun. I, I'm the worst at pretending that I'm having fun. I actually just stand there and I'm just pissed, you know. <laughs> and those guys never do that, you know. The show must go on, you know. You get. I don't remember you ever being sulky though when no, we no, played together I, in Alice. You didn't really sulky. I'm older now. I can get it. I think Alice has has 
instilled in me, instilled in everybody in the band that the show and the, uh, yeah. the show always comes first. You can leave your sort of attitude. If you're having a bad day, bad experience, bad, whatever you leave that in the dressing room and you come out on stage and you know, you give it the same energy that Alice gives. So, so I, in though, in that respect, but of course I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Sometimes, you it know, happen for the whole show. I get over it after a couple songs and do my thing. You know? All right. There's, well, there's, there's a lot of notes that, I mean, I, I, I'm thank God I have a really great guitar tech because I'm always in tune for the most part. I'm always in tune and I play a lot of wrong notes, but they're, they're always in tune, Reb. Yeah, but you look cool as hell, man. <laughs> well, favorite thing you do. I remember when I first joined the band and uh, I, you know, you were just a, such a rock star and I was not. And, and uh, watching what are you, you talking about, you had already, you'd done it. You, you wrote those three songs with Kip Winger in one day and basically, you know, crystallize your career in one yeah. day. I mean, those yeah, songs better. you still play in the set today, right? Oh yeah, hell yeah. But um, you know, you you'd go to Denny's with a feather in your hat and leather pants and, <laughs> and, and you know, <laughs> which was amazing and Alice loved that about you, but I you did this one move that was so cool. You I remember looking at you and uh the, one of the first nights and you would do like the Chuck Berry move but you do it in a circle. And I'm like, oh, oh, yeah. Chuck Berry move in a circle. That's pretty cool. <laughs> um, you know, you, you, you don't look up there, your own moves. Which I'm getting more and more like Chuck Berry uh, every single tour because, <laughs> it, because, it, because it gets more sporadic. Uh, you know, like like the last time I saw Ch uh, Chuck Berry here in in Sweden, you know, he was he was an older gentleman at that point, and, and he was he had a great show. Don't get me wrong, but everybody was waiting for the duck walk. So, like, literally the last twenty seconds of the show. <laughs> He kind of went again, 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 and then everyone went, ah, crazy. and 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 that was it. So, yeah, folks, um, we'll see on the uh, too close for comfort tour, uh, how much duck walking I'm doing. But you know what? I, I feel as long as we have it, um, in our bodies and in our sort of, you know, it's it's as long as we're not breaking things and straining things, we, you yeah, got to go for it. I make weird faces when i play guitar you have the ultimate yeah. guitar face yes do we have any of those pictures rep uh oh, geez, no <laughs> um please no but um my my brother came to see a show um the director of the opera guy you know and he's, yes. he's my he's my beautiful gay brother and he 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 was like you're very good but you need to stop making those ugly faces and I, i'm like yeah i don't even know that i'm making oh sure you don't know you're making them no really i don't i don't know that i'm making them um that's yeah, a good just, that's actually not a bad face at all man that's you know? uh, that's that's well i'm i'm in the zone <laughs> always playing with mr joel oh my gosh joel is like a machine he's really something it's it's like perfection you know he uh learns the stuff you know i'm the music director and half the time i'm going what's that part again joel you know he, he learns everything he, he's like rehearses constantly um and he plays it's like perfection. It really is. You know, he plays super fast. He can play anything. Uh, he really is up there. You know, both of his uh, parents were violinists. So uh, they, they uh, taught him like a regime of, of practicing and all that. So he really is, is great. And he's funny, funny, funny guy. Great on the bus, man. It's really cool that you're able to, like you, you just mentioned with, um, you know, D Schneider and, and now with Joel, you, you, you got, you're able to be in a very light, hearted good place when you're on tour and um and it was like that with alice especially with you in the band back in 96 how we first met i mean we had never met really in those days because i i i love that you give me credit for the for the you know the feather in my cap but that was the band i was in electric angels when we were living in new york city and we were like you know we were instilled by our singer that we had to follow the code of 20 you are you are this person 24/7 24, 24 hours a day 7 days a week you are always in you know your it's not even we don't call it a costume it's what you wear it's your life so i i definitely had that 
And honestly, a lot of them came from uh, Hanoi Rocks albums, you know, just like looking at the uh, staring at the album covers and stuff. But we were both on the same label back in those days. But you probably didn't know that Electric Angels was signed to Atlantic Records. I think but, I did. That. I OK, but, but, but you guys were signed by the right guy. <laughs> <laughs> where, where we were not actually and uh and unfortunately you know as things in atlantic records back in those days ha happen you know they would throw out a lot of albums you know they'd release a lot of albums and whichever one stuck the, you know you they got they got the uh you know the push and the priority i remember skid row being one of those bands winger being one of those bands but who was your a and r guy again uh well Bo Hill got us the deal, but Jason Flom was the was Jason. the guy. But, but but the thing is, though, Winger was one of those records that they threw out there, and it didn't stick. And if Rod Morgenstein hadn't have known the program director uh, at MTV, we would never would have got that one play at three in the morning on a Saturday, uh, Headbangers Ball, um, and it was Madeleine. And the next morning, radio got uh, you know bombarded with calls. And that's what uh, was the reason, the only reason we didn't go up on a shelf uh, like uh, so many other bands. And, yeah. Um, you know, yeah, it took a long time for that album to go gold. But, uh, you know. And how do you think that album, like, how did you do it? Was it just getting in the getting in the van? Because it was, was it, did you tour with Winger? Did you go right into the bus or did you go? Never, yeah, you know, we'd never toured. We were session musicians, right? And so the only thing I'd ever done was fortune. You play and jump on the keyboards in Florida. Um, <laughs> but that helped me a little bit anyway. Uh, no, my first gig was, you know, getting on the bus. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, well, there's a closet. There's a place for my beer. This is the greatest thing ever. And we're going to drive down the road every day. This is amazing. And so we do our first show. We're opening for the Scorpions in Milwaukee. And uh, my amp blows up first song. Kip talks to the audience. You know, yeah, you people are <laughs> you people are great. Thank you so much for coming. Mm -hmm. it's great to be here. So the Scorpion's like, who the fuck are these guys? <laughs> They're terrible. They're <laughs> terrible. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we almost got kicked off the tour. Um, <laughs> so it learned really fast how to talk to the audience. He totally ripped it off from Klaus Mine. You know, he was like, all right, people, how you feel tonight? <laughs> Completely ripped, and and it worked. Put it up a couple octaves. I love it. So, exactly. so how long did you do those types of that type of touring before things or or once uh, Headbangers Ball? See, because your experience with Headbangers Ball worked out a lot better than mine, because our, with Electric Angels, we knew Ricky Rackman very well. We were just always that band that didn't that almost you know uh, always the bride. It's made never a bride is that yeah. sort of thing we had been in los angeles we had toured we had we had opened up for every cool band that we thought was cool like you know balam and the angel zodiac mind warp uh you know done shows with with, with gnr and faster pussycat so we were like thinking okay you know things are gonna but nothing happened so we ended up we went to new york we did the opposite thing but it seems to me that once mtv picked up on that song Madeline, then it was kind of like a, it was a straight shot for you guys. Yeah. 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 Um, but we were never a headlining act at, at one point, very briefly, uh, we headlined theaters with extreme opening up before they made it big. Um, and, uh, they thanked us on their first album because when, uh, when Kip and I heard more than words, we were just like, dude, that's a number one song. And yeah. Kip was like, you need to go to radio stations every morning and play that song on an acoustic. And they did. Um, and I think that helped them, but that was the only really headlining thing. It was just headlining theater. So we were never a headlining band, you know, we never made it to that point. We wanted to be at like, you know, Cinderella or. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, I do remember he seeing that song live from extreme band from Boston playing at the cat club down in, in New York. Remember the cat club on 13th street? So they do very well. I partied there a few times when exactly. I was a kid. So, and I yeah. remember hearing that and going, yeah, this is something special and big. Yeah. And a lot of really good. Go ahead. 
there's a few things that get lost in our story together because we were the first two guitar players, but we had a third guitar player who was also in winger who had also been playing with Alice before going back to that picture, Vic of uh, winger. There's a guy named Paul Taylor who, who sort of was the, uh, I would say a great utility guy as well. He played keyboards and guitar. So you're yeah, saying you're, right. you're playing your, you say you're playing jump in Florida. Was there ever a fight to get to the keyboard or did you guys oh, just no. say you, you got it? No, 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 I'm not. A, you know, I just, I'm a decent, I can noodle around, but not like him. He's a real keyboardist. Um, um, but no, Paul, you know, Paul, he's just a great guy. He's so easy to get along with. And, Oh, uh, great. He's, he's, he's the great Larry song. David of rock and roll. What are you talking about? He's the what of rock and he's, roll? He's the Larry David of rock and roll. Oh, my Lord. Oh, my God, yes. Okay. Everything. Right. <laughs> he's, he's, he's great. So, um, yeah, I forgot that Paul was in the band. That was a great band. Todd Jensen, who's now with Journey, uh, playing bass. Jimmy um, DeGrasso on the drums. Still a good friend. Talk to him every once in a while. Yeah. And uh, yeah. of course, this guy named Alice Cooper. Remember our first show ever together? Oh my God! Yes, <laughs> so well. I actually partied with Slash. Slash took me out, me and him, and three chicks, and we went to this, you know, bar and sat in a round booth. And we got to know Slash, and he was so nice. He was saying stuff like, "I'll never be the guitar player you are, Rev." And I'm like, "Oh my God, Slash! That was so nice of you to say, my Lord, aren't you wonderful?" What a nice guy. And the best story ever, Ryan. You're going to love this story because um, you're in it. All right. Is it um, and I'm definitely going to love it. Okay. So yeah. this is my recollection of it. Um, I'm sitting there at the club after we're playing at Sammy Hagar's uh, club. Cabo Wabo. Wabo. Yeah. It was, uh, it, it was still owned by Van Halen. It co-owned, I think, a little bit. But it was it was Jorge, Sammy Hagar, and maybe maybe Eddie. I don't know. But yeah, it was it was Cabo Wabo and Cabo San Lucas. And that was the first time that we've ever, ever been a band. And it was recorded live for an album. Great idea. And an VH1. Album. And and record and recorded on, on tape for VH1. I think that's concert somewhere. That's funny. Yeah, huh? that wasn't a good decision, but um Anyway, Sammy comes up to me and he's like, you know what? You're great. How would you like to have my I Can't Drive 55 Gibson Red Explorer? And I was like, wow, Sammy Hagar, I would love to have your I Can't Drive 55 <laughs> Gibson Red Explorer. And I'm going to go get it right now. You wait right there. And so he disappeared. And then you and then he's gone for like a half an hour. And then you come up to me and go. You're not going to believe what just happened. Sammy Hagar told me that he was going to give me his I Can't Drive 55 Gibson Red Explorer. You know, that was just a great story. Sammy just laughed. You know? Here's the funny thing. This is, this is, how, this is uh, what's amazing. As, as Sammy was back in those days, because he did have his own uh, brand of tequila. I think he ended up selling it for a gazillion dollars or whatever. But he ended up leaving the club that night. So it wasn't until... I think two or three years later, I went down again to Cabo San Lucas with um, it wasn't maybe might have been Slash's Snake Pit, but I think it was this band called the Cover Police with um, who's uh, who who's in it? Gilby Clark's in it. Uh, uh, fucking um, drummer of Ozzy that passed away. I'm I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm coming up with bad uh, I, I names. Guitarist of of uh, Toto. Uh, oh, wow, Steve Lukather. Steve Lukather on guitar, Gilby, myself, and um, come on, man, someone in the chats, please help me out. Uh, Randy Castillo, of course. Oh, Randy, Castillo. Yeah. Randy Castillo, amazing, amazing fucking drummer. But but we called ourselves the Cover Police. We're down there just doing covers, basically, okay, some yeah. cheap trick songs and stuff like that. Sammy comes up to me, goes. I never forgot. I told you I give you a guitar. He hands me a like a, a yellow Hondo, uh, like a bright yellow Hondo with it has a a bumblebee on it, and it says Cabo San Lucas. It says Cabo Wabo on the guitar neck in, in abalone. He goes, I know it's not the guitar, but this is this will this is good, right? And I go, Oh, Sammy, this is awesome. This is more than good. So he he actually did do good on giving me a guitar. That is you never got a guitar. You still have it? I do. 
It's somewhere. Wow. I have no idea where, but That's it's somewhere cool. around here. That's There's a lot of things cool. I have no idea about these days, you know, because I'm, I'm, three different continents going around. There's, there's Africa, there's South Africa. There's, that's not a continent. Africa's a continent. See, I know a little bit. And then there's the, the, the U S and then here up here in Europe and in Scandinavia. And you are touring all around all the time as well. Right. Well, with white snake. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, and, but, but now um, wingers doing a big push this year for, we have a new album coming out. We just filmed the videos last week, three videos uh, we're going to Puerto Rico next week, and um, we're going to Australia. Um, we're look, and we're going playing Europe with Steel Panther. That'll be fun, dude. Hold on then to all those thoughts because a lot of these questions are coming from the people, and I want to have the people speak. But first, I want to just take a really quick break because I'm going to try and run and take a real quick pee. It's going to be okay. about sixty seconds or something like that. And that, yeah, I know, I know, folks. Come on. This is the podcast. That's what we do on a long term, you know, long form podcast. But we're going to do a uh, run, maybe the, um, Let's run the System 12 ad if we could, because we are here with a, a guitar legend and uh, iconic guitar player. If a lot of this, these stories have inspired you to play guitar, maybe you yourself want to learn guitar out there in the podcast land. Uh, this is the In the Trenches podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Roxy. That is Reb Beach there from a Winger, Whitesnake, and a million other bands. We're going to talk about them all. We're going to let you guys ask some questions. And uh, you know, Wick, if you can please run that, I will go pee. I'll be right back. Hello, Ryan Roxy here from the Alice Cooper Band, and I'd like to talk a little bit about one of my favorite things, playing guitar. Here at the RGA headquarters, which stands for Roxy Guitar Army, by the way, we've put together a guitar learning system that will get you playing and understanding the guitar faster than any other teaching program out there. We call it the System 12 Guitar Method, and it's designed to make the most out of your time, your effort, and your passion for learning guitar. By combining new school technology, old school mentoring, and the number 12, we have invented a new way to teach guitar. And over the past year, we have helped so many people who wanted to start or continue their guitar journey do exactly that. Now, we'd like to help you. There's never been a better time to start learning guitar than right now. If you think it's too hard, the System 12 makes it easy. If you think it'll take too much time, the System 12 will have you playing in 12 weeks. And if you think it's too expensive, the entire System 12 costs less than what one private guitar lesson would cost you at your local music store. Check out the official site or the links below in the description of this video to join the RGA and get started on your guitar journey with the System 12 Guitar Method. Now, let's get back into the trenches for some more rock and roll. Enjoy the show. Enjoy the ride. Mwah! That's it. There you go. I'm back here on In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy. I'm your host, Ryan Roxy, here with Reb Beach. And folks, yes, I just did take a pee break and even had time to wash my hands. Good man. Maybe. Um, <laughs> we're talking about uh, the fact that both um, Reb and I started in 1996 in the Alice Cooper Band. Um Obviously, Reb had had a lot of success with Winger and being a, a session musician, um, bef you know, before that. But then things after 96 for Reb, they really exploded for you in, in, in a lot of ways. And you got to play with a, a lot of household name bands that are I I iconic. You know, it, it just just to name a few, you have Don Dock and I saw the um, Night Ranger was in there. I did not hey, know that as well. You I, played yeah. I did a year with Night Ranger, which I love Night Ranger. Really good band, yeah. Good guys and good band as well. So I, so here's the deal, because there are so many questions that came in and slid in the DBMs. Uh, they wanted to ask you. I feel that it's time as a, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking at my script right now, but we need to get uh, the people speaking and uh, get some of these questions. If you don't mind, uh, we can take a few questions from the crowd. Does that sound okay, Reb? Wonderful. Great idea. Hit it, Mr. Vic. <laughs> now I just got to find where it is. I have all these things. Oh, man. You know, it's like I, I wanted to say let the people speak. You know what? Let's get right into let the people speak because I'll go with these other subjects a little bit later. Oh, okay. So, Sorry, Vic, I'm not following the script. You got some time? Good. Now that I just took a pee, I'm like, I've got all night now. We're good. So our first question, because these are all questions that uh, revolve around you and your illustrious career that you've had. Um, 
at Michelle Lupe Music. First question out of the gate. Ask uh, in, 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 that's, that's Michele Lupe. Michele. Michele yeah. is a keyboard player and backing vocalist who's currently touring with White Snake. Um, yeah. Who is your favorite singer and why? Oh boy, that's that's really something. Uh, my favorite singer, gosh, uh, maybe uh, Paul Rogers. Every time I hear his voice, you know, uh, that, I, that's a perfect voice. Um, you know, I, I like the, the blues based singers like that. I'm not really into the, uh, you know, the dog, you know, guys as much. Were you on that tour that we did, uh, in Australia with Paul, Ta with, uh, no, I don't think so. Paul Taylor was in the band at that point, but, um, who was the guitarist? Then? That was, that's weird. I think you might've been. Doug Pinnock is uh, my, another one of my favorites. I actually did an album with him. If you get a chance to hear it, it's called The Mob. And uh, I had these, you know, pop, just not pop rock, but, you know, just basic rock riffs. And I'm good at writing rock rock riffs. So I had these riffs and I wanted to put Doug Pinnock's voice. From, King, from King's X. I, I want to give the people that are listening just a little bit of background. His voice with my, you know, wingery rock songs, just, you know, straight ahead rock tunes. And it worked great. It's really different. It's really, it came out really cool. Kit produced it. That's the mob. We yeah. will check it out. Everyone out there, if you're uh, maybe Federica, who's done such a great job promoting this show this week, maybe you can put the uh, link for that on either the description or you can put it right in the live chat right now. Because, folks, if you're just tuning in, we are here with Reb Beach on the In the Trenches podcast. And uh, do us a favor. Give us a like right now or a subscribe because uh, we want to get as many eyeballs on this episode as we can. There you go. Vic just put up it right, it's right over there somewhere. Um, say hi to McKelle too. Hi, McKelle. Is that you? Yeah. You're watching, I guess. That's great. I just hey, saw you were together uh, a few weeks ago. Sorry. I, I, you know what? I, I asked my producer, is it McKelle or is it Michelle? He says Michelle. So, you know, damn it. Oh, so it's not actually McKelle? <laughs> no, it, I thought it was. I'm getting flipped off by my producer now. Um, anyway, at Six Strings Forever, which is Matt Bishop. I know Matt Bishop. Uh, what was the first amp and guitar you ever owned? And what is the amplifier that you're using now? It's a very amp, amp, amplified question. Yeah, the first, the first amp um, I had was a trainer. Well, those are Kitty Hawks, right? That's, that was the first... That was my first endorsement of amps. And we ended up calling them shitty Hawks after the first night of touring <laughs> because we blew up. We had 10 of them. We blew up eight of them. That, um, that wasn't the show with the Scorpions, was it? Yes. Yeah, that was. Okay. Okay. Yeah, the shitty Hawks all blew up. But, um, but no, my first amp was a, was a trainer amp, like a, like a big kind of, you know, tube thing. 12, yeah. yeah. Uh, four or no, four ten or something. No, it was a two twelve. Uh, anyway, uh, and my guitar was an area strat and it had two pickups and I wanted it to have three because Ace Freely had three pickups and I didn't have another hole for a pickup. So you I didn't have a hole for the smoke bomb that would go in the middle. Of the pickup. Right. Just, yeah. <laughs> so I bought a sticker of an I that you put on a mailbox, you know, to spell your name. So I got the I and I put that in there as a to kind of looked like a pickup. But is, uh, that, is, that in the, is that the guitar that you're talking about when you have the Rick Springfield um, haircut? No, no, no. Thing? That was my first. Um, uh, a friend of mine had an endorsement with Kramer and he brought me into the Kramer company. I picked that one. I handpicked that one from the uh, warehouse. Wow. That was a great one. And um, that's the one that has Reb on it that uh, Kip hated me for. Well, but, you know what? She, you know what? Yeah. She's out there right now feeling, you know what? I made that guitar. I made the relationship tumultuous from the beginning. She should be proud. You know, and, and, do you still have that guitar? Uh, uh, no, I, I sold it to a friend of mine a long time ago, but he lives down the street. So I can. Do you take it. the rev off or do you keep it? Um, no, it's, it's still there. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I also, my next guitar was when I heard uh, Brad Gillis from Night Ranger. Uh, that was one of the first videos on MTV was don't tell me you love me. Yeah. And that, that whammy bar 
I was like, a whammy bar. <laughs> so, well, the technique that he would use, the floating tremolo, remember he'd hit the back of the guitar and that was his, that was, yeah. Because he had it floating. It wasn't, it wasn't, yeah. Yeah, and it was floating, right. yeah, yeah. 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 And Halen's wasn't floating. Um, I don't think. Yeah. No, it and wasn't. So, that was the whole deal. Yeah. And so I rushed out and bought a G and L strat and I just started making whammy noises all day long, six hours a day. Wow. You know, what do I do? You know, what if I hit this and make this happen? You know, <laughs> this is all day long, 16 years old. Um, but yeah, those well, you had your, you had your signature guitar, uh, when you joined in 96, I, I remember, um, it, it was the, the Ibanez. Oh, the Voyager. Yeah. That was a great guitar. The Ibanez Voyager was a really cool guitar, really well done. But as soon as the end of Winger happened, um, Ibanez dropped me like a hot potato. And, it, you know, if you opened up the book, the Ibanez book, it would be like Joe Satriani, <laughs> Steve Vai, <laughs> Red Beach. <laughs> You know, <laughs> and then Red Beach is a tiny little picture in the back. <laughs> they tried yeah. to rewrite history. We're going to talk about that. There's a little question about that a little bit later as well. At Alex Jeruso and a Brown Guy zero one zero eight, um, they had a kind of um, it wasn't them both asking a combined question. They both had sort of a similar question, so I, I gave them both credit for this. Uh, what was the turning point that sparked your passion for guitar? A concert or a song that inspired you to exclaim, I want to do this? And I think we answered it just a little bit yeah. earlier with, it was Kiss. It was right? Kiss. I was going to be Elton John before that. I wanted to play piano uh, until I saw Ace and said, what? This, this is me. This is where I belong. You know, I, I knew, I'm like, and also I saw Def Leppard uh, uh, and the young kids, like Steve Clark was playing a Explorer. Yep. I rushed out and bought that Explorer. You can you saw that picture of me with the Explorer. Um, I, th I gotta think that that was the other guy. Was that, it the other guy? I think yeah. it was, yeah. Cause, cause, cause Steve okay. Clark always, uh, played like a, a Les Paul, like a white Les Paul. Okay, that was right, kind of you're right, you're right, you're right. It was the other it guy. Was, with the so you're, you're talking like first, first album or high, either high and dry or on through the night. That's what you're talking, that era. It was on through the night um, or high wow. and dry because they opened for Judas Priest. And uh, I saw that Explorer and that was cool. And that kid was 17. I'm like, he's 17. I'm 17. I can do that. I'm, that's what I'm going to do. And I meant it, man. I, I was, you know, I was voted most likely to be a rock star in high school. You know, it's in the yearbook. You know. At that point, <laughs> did you look over your shoulder and you go, you know what? She's only 17. <laughs> Hey! <laughs> Things you can't sing about these days. So at Kofi Bach, Carrie Walters, there you are making your way into the questions. Thank you very much. You've worked with so many phenomenal musicians over the course of your career. Which three people with whom you haven't played with before would you like to collaborate with if you had a chance? Not one, um, but three. Uh, three, yeah, that makes it a couple. <laughs> it's like she could have said seven, but no, she said three. <laughs> I mean, I, I, if it's just one, who would be your who would be your gold medalist? I'd love to write a song for Steven Tyler. That would that would be my ultimate cool thing. Um, you know, I'd I'd like to work with uh, uh, you know, the coolest bass players there are. Um, there's who's the one guy who played at Bela Fleck and the Fleck Tones? I always wanted to to work with that guy, and now I can't think of his name. Unbelievable, uh, Victor Wooten. I always wanted to work with Victor Wooten. Nice. Okay. Yeah, um, it, it, it's it's, yeah. it's a tough one. So you got Steven Tyler, Victor Wooten, and now for our bronze medalist, <laughs> never ever ever discount the bronze. <laughs> uh, maybe um, you know, I'd say my favorite guy, Andy Timmons. Uh, I wouldn't generally like working with another guitar player that's way better than me, but we're so different that it might work. You know, I, I'd love to, because he's just so amazing. You know, that was my first tour I ever went on was electric angels. Uh, we supported uh, danger, uh, danger, danger, danger. Yeah. And we, she and, and, right tour. I mean, he every, was fine. no, no. Every night we got naughty, naughty and yeah. uh, we had rock fun, rock fun. It was, everything was always in doubles, you know, and, but we love we love Steve West. We love Bruno. We love everybody in that band. Danger yeah, those Danger. are great. Those are great you know, band. Great guys. Did 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 Danger Danger and Winger? That seems to me like a you know shoe in. Did you guys ever tour together? 
No. I wow. Don't so. that no, seems no, we like never it. did because I would have remembered. Um, yeah. You know, who did open for us was Dream Theater before they were big. And um, they, they played really soft. Like you could barely hear their instruments. It's crazy how soft they played. Um, and they, you know, they just didn't really say much, you know. Uh, See, now that I think that show would work good with the audiences, but back then I think people would be like, there would be a lot of what, huh? Yeah. Huh? Huh? <laughs> hey? huh? Oh, okay. Huh. Yeah, they were. They're even more. They're more progressive. Winger can be progressive, but you know we have the the hit pop. There is a question about that because there is a lot of musicianship going on not with not only with you, but you know with with Kip and his extensive classical background as well. Oh, yeah. So. Um, well, here we go at Rachel Dover asking the next question at Rachel Dover, two R's on that. How does playing with winger compare to white snake? Saw you in Newcastle, by the way, it was amazing. Oh, good. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, well, you know, uh, winger is more complicated for sure. Um, you know, the white snake stuff is just straight ahead blues rock. Um, whereas Winger has a lot of playing um, complicated riffs while singing. So um, it, it takes more concentration um, for sure. I, I uh, you know, I love playing in both bands. You know, Whitesnake, we stay at the Mondrian. We stay at, you know, the full <laughs> seasons. And, you know, we're flying the private jet. The W. Um, we're, we're in the van on a four-hour drive staying at the Hampton Inn. <laughs> um, you know, uh, it's but, all the way you yeah. say it though. It could be the the Hampton Inn, <laughs> the Hampton Inn, the, the, um, red, yeah. the red roof. You know, Do they Winger, even have red roofs anymore? <laughs> Winger's my legacy. You know, they're they're my best friends. It keeps my best friend. I talk to him almost every day. Um, so it's a little different than you know White Snake, which is you know we're all friends in that as well. But you know they're not like my brothers. You know? Exactly. Yeah. For two guys that for two guys that first looked at each other and, and didn't sniff each other's butts, they went, mm. or maybe you did sniff each other. And went, Man, I don't know. <laughs> but but it's great to see that you guys have like, you know, maintained this amazing relationship all throughout the years. Um, here we go at co underscore wanton b zero eight one two. I wish I knew your name, but you know what? I know that you are Japanese because I saw your uh, profile when you vote it so i probably wouldn't be able to say your name in your in the symbols either so is there a plan love it. Winger. i love the way that, this is good writing too this is very cool writing is there a plan the number four winger mm -hmm. the number two go out on a world tour seeing you at loud parks was a happy nice. experience, a happy experience. <laughs> so uh so I, i'm going to just say co Co asked this question: Is it's there? A you see, it's Watanabe. Oh, of Go course, yeah. we love Watanabe. Wait, of course, I know Watanabe. Stop it! I love him. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you know that guy? Okay. Yeah, um, yeah. Huge, huge fan of both Alice, classic rock. Uh, uh, you know, Red Beach. So, uh, talk okay. to. Him. So yeah, Is Loud Park. Is there a plan for Winger to go on a world tour? Um, uh, like I said, we're going to Europe uh, in May with Steel Panther. And uh, definitely want to go to Japan with this record. We want to promote it everywhere we can, Australia, South America. Um, and so that's the plan is to really push Winger. You know, um, we're not getting any younger. Uh, you know, Rod's going to be 70. And, uh, you know, we'd like Get to. Get the out of here. Get the fuck out of here. Really? Yeah. 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 Damn. He was yeah, he playing, playing so good. I, we played together at the uh, last year on the. Uh, monsters of rock uh cruise and it was it was i don't know if you remember that we were there but uh, i saw you no, guys I saw you there i saw you, you there you asked me to come jam with you you um, killed you it you, you killed it so so good the band was and and, and rod played his ass off and yeah. it was i saw the first show in the big theater on that one and by the way folks if, you, if you're if you're interested in monsters of rock you got to go support him got to go on the cruise but you know what you also got to do every single thursday every single thursday you got to check out my radio show on the monsters of rock radio on the dash radio network platform uh, you can get all that information on ryanroxy.com sorry to put in a shameless plug but Not at all. You know, you I saw, next year? Huh? Are, are you doing it this year, the, the cruise? 
I haven't not done the, we haven't talked about it, but I'm doing a radio show with Monsters of Rock now every week. I'm doing it on Thursdays and I get to play all my favorite bands. I get to play your stuff. I get to play, you know, everyone that I've ever toured with. So it's, it's a cool sort of two hour uh, weekly show that I get to do on the radio. So, um, so there you go. So, you, so, uh, Wontanabe, you get you got your question answered. There is a lot of touring planned. I think there should be some maybe some Alice and Winger combo at one point. Doesn't it seem like it would make sense? It kind of does. Absolutely. It just kind of makes sense. You know? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure we'll hook up. We're doing a lot of shows. We're we're gonna book the crap out of this year for sure and next year. Right on. Well, let's let's uh, move on with uh, let letting the people speak because that's what they're doing. Uh, you're speaking with folks, uh, Reb Beach, and uh, you're uh, listening to the In the Trenches podcast right now, and you're listening to a segment called Let the People Speak, where people DM, and you can do that anytime you want throughout our week. If you have interest in our guests, and a lot of people had a lot of interest in Reb this week, just put in your DMs to myself or put it into the In the Trenches Instagram site at Ryan Roxy at Instagram, or you know what? Just inundate Vic Chalfont's inbox with requests if you want. He'll be fine. At Star Garcia asks, will White Snake continue the farewell tour in the U.S., or is White Snake done touring? Good question. I just don't know the answer to that. Um, you know, uh, that's up to David, and I know that, you know, he needed a break after he had this horrible throat condition uh he's fine now though um so yeah that, so it seems like every one of you guys was getting hit up with something you know on that last tour it was like one after the other it was like i oh, yeah. can't do the show can't do the show and then and then when i think when dave finally said you know what i'm i'm experiencing some some difficulties he it's, some you know, weird thing happened to his throat i mean it really did happen you know he called me to cancel the scorpion story which was a bummer because that was a you know, huge was really looking forward to that um, but he mm -hmm. called me and he was like, Rebel, I just can't do it. You know, it's like, wow, he's <laughs> something really wrong, you know. Um, we had just so, gotten done playing well, a show with the Scorpions in Greece, right? When you guys were supposed to go do that afterwards. And um, yeah, it was a uh, bummer. They're so great. I mean, they're, they look amazing. I had dinner with them a couple of times and, you know, they're just, they look fabulous, you know, <laughs> they're just like, wow, you're in incredible shape. Well, I have those house on the beach, you know. <laughs> well, you remember, Rev, that was our first tour in Alice Cooper was, was the Scorpions. Scorpions. Yeah. Wow. You had forgotten that. I was huh? with Winger as well. Was so. it? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Where you blew up all the shitty Hawks. Yeah. See, I had a, and what's funny is I had a, an amp company back then called Red Bear. Don't look oh, for I them remember now. That. I remember your well, don't look for them now, folks. They, they all the Russian tubes that they had back then. I think they've used up and um, mm -hmm. are sold out or whatever. But mm -hmm. yeah, um, I remember I I had those because all the band members. I think they had a whole line. If you remember, Wizard amps, and they had a four twelve. Uh, cabinets and then a 212 on top of that. And I thought that was so cool that yeah. I wanted that as well. So um, I got that year, maybe a year or two after that. And that's when I started playing with Slash. So there you go. I'm glad we're motivating you to play guitar. If you uh, are just joining us right now, uh, go back to the commercial break where I took a pee and you can talk about System 12 and start learning how to play guitar. And you too can uh, do worldwide tours with. Uh, Scorpions. I think that just goes compulsory. You just have to tour with the Scorpions once in your career, right? We've yeah. been lucky enough to do it a couple of times. Um, so uh, before uh, last question of letting the people speak, uh, do you have any new, Oh, this is comes from at Balan Rachel, Balan Blanche, Rachel. Uh, do you have any new year's resolutions, Red Beach? Oh, you know, it, it lasts for like a week, and then I just forget about it whenever I go. Like, well, I'm gonna, you know, do less. Stop here, smoking so. pot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, I'm I'm almost sixty. You're not, it's like you're not gonna stop smoking pot anytime soon. You got, I mean, come on, it's 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 legal now. Yeah, I, I mean, I, it helps me write. You know, we 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 wrote every winger album we ever wrote, totally stoked. I mean, you know, in the daytime, you, you know. And there's my soundbite. <laughs> Red Beach is going to be here on Blabbermouth tomorrow evening. I can almost, it almost writes itself. Brave words, it just wrote itself. Red Beach, we wrote every winner song, Stone of Our Ass. Maybe not the first album. because we right. were, Yeah, because we were, uh, had to commute there. 
but uh, you know, the second album we got a house and you know, hung out. I love um, it. But yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I I didn't make any resolutions. This, I'm done with. I, this is me. I'm I'm not changing. Well, do you, there was a question. Um, I think maybe Federica had asked it, and I I just glanced over it because we were getting so much into your history about. Um, yeah, that was like two weeks ago. I love it. Throughout your career with Winger, the band has explored a variety of different musical styles and influences. Um, how do you see the evolution of Winger's sound over the years, and how do you approach incorporating new elements into the band's music? Um, you know, when you when you got Kip Winger at the helm, uh, all different kinds of stuff is bound to happen. You know, uh, the more he experiments with um, writing these symphonies, I think the more uh, uh, interesting other instruments are going to creep into our music. Um, but, you know, when we first started out, uh, it was just all about just my riffs, you know, play me a riff. And, you know, like I played this, the riff for 17 to Kip. And he said, that's a chorus. I know yeah, that. that really busy thing. And he said, that's a chorus. And I'm like, no, it's not. It's just dumb little riff. It sounds like rat. And, you know, it's, it's kind of cool. I like it. It's not dumb. It's kind of cool. And he's like, no, that's a chorus. You know, play in the key of A. And he would play his bass and drum machine. Dum, 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 dum. And I would just play a riff. And he'd be, that's the verse. Now we need a bridge. You know, and that, and we just bang, 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 just bang it out. Um, and then later on, Kip started to you know, put more of his creativity into it rather than just, you know, my riff. He would play keyboards and, uh, um, you know, get more, uh, more, uh, I don't know, uh, progressive uh, right. changes in there. Yeah, you know? sure. So, so we definitely did grow. And Winger 4 was Kip's baby. Karma was my baby because Kip was really kind of, tired of writing and um because he had just written a symphony and he said you know what do you want to do and i'm like i want to make a bang your head rock record like the first one just you know like heavy and uh and that's what we did karma was like that um so you know this latest album is going to be kind of all of the above well i mean you've been able to incorporate your own stuff in there too i, I give Kip a lot of credit because he deserves a lot of credit for it. But your stuff, you've had three solo albums, Fusion Demos, Masquerade, and just mo most recently, A View from the Inside that you put out. Mm -hmm. um, part of that is actually culminating in you doing your own guitar clinics as well. And I know that you have something coming up pretty soon that I maybe do. we can talk about. Yeah, yeah. I've got a, a clinic at the local store here. Um, which is great. It's in, in Pittsburgh um, in uh, a little town called Blonox, but it's a beautiful big store and they've got a big stage. And uh, I'm going to do a clinic for about an hour and a half. I'm going to play some of the songs from review from the inside and I'll do black magic and uh, 17 and head of her heartbreak. And I'll tell funny stories of the road um, and maybe uh, have a beer with everyone afterwards and sign stuff and, you know, just have fun. Awesome. So yeah. that'll be that'll be coming up real soon. Yeah, and third guitars, right, promoting my new Sir guitar. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Nice, man. Well, we have a little thing. I mean, if you remember with Alice, he would always say, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. And, mm -hmm. you know, Reb never lets the truth get in the way of a good story. So we, we call it maybe a little bit of a fact or fiction. Um, but here's a couple questions that we had for you uh, of never letting the truth get in the way of a good story. You recorded on the soundtrack of the Sega Daytona USA video game. Oh, my God. That was a nightmare. Absolutely. So it was true. That's a yeah. fact, folks. Facts. Yeah. Why was I it a nightmare? Because I went in there, I was late. I, I had Rod told me what time to be there. Rod got me the gig. Rod told me what time to be there, and um, I was there. I, I heard him wrong or something. I was there like an hour late, and um, and and so I get there and I plug in, and it's uh, Japanese gentlemen that are all kind of sitting around and staring at me, um, and so I played the first solo, and they're like. <clears throat> You know, it, it was in happy scale, happy scale. You know, it's in it's in a major key. Major. Yeah, yeah. Uh, minor minor folks is, is considered to be unhappy, but I find it, you know, 
D minor, the saddest of all keys. The keys, but it was all major. And so I can't rock in major. So I just did all of my Molly Hatchet licks and Leonard Skinner, you know, you know, and they're like, this ain't no fucking Molly Hatchet, you know. <laughs> well, you know, it's in a happy key, you know, to play something more rock and roll, you know. So, so I had to do like minor pentatonic over major, just make it work somehow. Um, so I had a, I had a rough time. That was a rough session, but that's amazing that you know that. Well, hey, the, the, the uh, as far as a rough session, is that the roughest or has there been rougher? It had to have been rougher. Oh, what was yeah. the worst session you've ever been on? The Kenny Loggins one was, was really, uh, you know, just nervous as hell with him. And, and you said it's like good, good, good came out of it, right? Um, actually, they didn't use the track. They didn't even use the track that we did. But, um, you know. In, I, see, I would have walked away thinking that the story was good. You man, hell, you worked with Kenny Loggins and, 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 I, it, and it, it, it did. It was that was fiction. OK, I, why is it fiction? Like, I don't even know why it's fiction. Mm -hmm. No, it's not fiction. I mean, just, I, I don't, just, oh, yeah. no, I just, it's just words. It, it just wasn't a good session. All right. <laughs> yeah, so. Okay, here's another one. You recorded on the soundtrack of the iconic 80s movie, The Lost Boys. Oh, yeah. At the end of that movie, the movie ends with my guitar, like solo my guitar at the end of it, it because I'm playing on a song, uh, Don't Let the Sun Go Down on Me, uh, by uh, Elton John is sung by the Roger Daltrey. version. Okay, yeah, it's, it's sung by Roger Daltrey, and it ends the movie with the title credits rolling at the end. Um, I want to say that the actress. Why do I know this? This is my wife's going to kill me for knowing this because that's Jamie Gertz. I want to say yeah. that's Jamie Gertz. It is Jamie Gertz. I like saying right? her name too. Gertz. I have not mentioned. I have not put in the word. I have not said the word out loud. Jamie Gertz, Gertz in, in about a week. I'd say it's been at least a week since I said the name Jamie Gertz. At least a week ago, you just said Jamie Gertz. Yeah. <laughs> so I wake up in the morning, and that's how I wake up. Gertz, <laughs> Gertz, <laughs> you've been Gertz again. All right, um, Gertz, Batman. Fact or fiction? Famous blockbuster director Michael Bay directed a video for Winger. Yeah, uh, he did, and it oh, was also fact. another yeah. fact. He did. He did. Uh, can't get enough. And it, you know, it looks like a Pepsi commercial. It's really well filmed. Um, I think, you know, Kip and Paul slept with the girls that were the girls uh, in the video. Um, Neither of them were Jamie Gertz. I'll tell you that no, much. No, that's, that's for sure. But he was he was tough, man, because he started the whole thing off by saying, listen, this is going to be a tough shoot. I don't even know it's going to be any good. I don't really want to do music videos, but I have to do this. So we're just going to get it done as quickly as possible. Um, and I, you know, let's just, just, I'll tell you exactly what to do, but it's not going to be great. Um, and so I was like, you know, way to motivate us, motivate us, Michael. <laughs> I'm Thanks, ready now. You know, and like I stood up to him and, and the whole band started laughing like, Rip, Jesus Christ. You know? <laughs> This is Michael he's Bay. Not, he could blow you up. up. He could he's actually not. blow you up in a movie. Yeah, All right. No, there was no nothing blew up. It's, it's you could true. say you could say that I've been he in what was that? What was the worst movie you've ever been in? You could say, well, you know what, Michael? From my experience with uh, what is it, the Bob Dylan film? Armageddon sucks. Uh, no. uh, on the Bob Dylan is uh, um, Hearts of Fire. Yeah, uh, 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 Michael, I've been in Hearts of Fire. <laughs> I've been in hearts of fire. So please, what, 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 this is my vision. So here we go. Last <laughs> fact or fiction. Um, did the show Beavis and Butthead have any adverse uh, results for the band Winger? Absolutely it did. That is Hugely it did. Mm -hmm. um, as a matter of fact, we were on the road and we were selling out theaters. Uh, we were on the bus. And this kid said, hey, you guys got to see this cartoon. I brought you a VHS of it. Um, and that was the media at the time was a VHS. And so we put this thing on on the bus. That was before that was before CDs, kids. Oh, they don't know yeah. CDs either. Oh, I'm sorry. It was before Blu-rays. No, they don't. Yeah. They don't know Blu-rays. No, Blu it was before streaming. Let's put it that way. Yeah, it was way before. And so uh, they, you know, they proceeded to in the cartoon. They hung this kid from his underwear 
and from a tree and he was wearing a winger t-shirt and he was overweight he was you know had acne and you know with glasses and his name was stuart and he was in every episode and then they went to his house and his parents were wearing winger t-shirts and the dog was wearing a winger t-shirt and they were all nerds um and so that was we actually saw a direct result of that uh thing in the weeks that would follow we had to cancel the tour because people wouldn't be caught dead buying a ticket to a winger show after that and then metallica didn't help with the you know showing uh, in, in their video, their biggest video, they throw darts at a poster of Gip Winger and uh, they would show it at their live show. And my friend who went to see them said the entire arena laughed at that part of the video where uh, Lars throws darts at Kip, you know. And so and that, that was the, kid, and the kid in the cartoon, what was his name that wore the Winger t shirt? Stuart. Stuart. He yeah. later changed his name, is now Sam Bankman Freed. <laughs> Sam Bankman who's, Freed? Who's laughing now? Who's laughing now, huh? Well, I guess he's not laughing. Exactly. He didn't make fun of us. They made fun of him. Um, oh, man. Yeah. So so it, you, it, it, it was a cultural shift. It was a music t shift. It was for a everybody. paradigm shift for, for everybody. A lot of the bands that, that we were, all the bands from Los Angeles, you know, because Nevermind came out that same year, right around that time. And I remember the first time hearing Nevermind, I said, oh, something's changing. Nirvana's well, going to change the game. I sold all my guitars, 20 guitars. I had just bought a house in Florida, sold that. I was only there for nine months, 10 months. Um, <clears throat> moved back to Pittsburgh from Florida, which I wish I didn't have to do. And uh, that was a really rough time. And then Kip told me that Alice was auditioning people. And I didn't have enough money to get there. So Kip loaned me 500 bucks so that I could fly out and I, so I could buy, buy clothes, something cool to wear. I was I made it there. I was nervous as a cat at the audition, and every, there was like ten guitar players there. I remember. Me. I we remember all the guitar players. I was there because we, we, it was the room at Mates, and we were yep. all sitting in sort of the Bobby's office while everyone would go over and do the audition right next to that room, right next to it. And folks, that Mates, I talk about it a lot on the podcast, is the rehearsal room where pretty much every single band, Foo Fighters, Guns N' Roses, Everything. James Addiction, uh, White Snake, White uh, Scorpions, uh, Alice Cooper, everyone rehearses there at that place. Bobby, you're a very, uh, you know what, is you know, you know what you did, Bobby. You know yeah. who you are, Bobby. I love you, Bobby. But you know, no, I love Bobby so much. But he's yeah. he's he's created like an institution over there. Um, but we were all there in that room, and I remember, I remember thinking, Reb's got this gig. You know, you've got. But 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 I remember you have. I I, I said to myself, you've got half the gig. Because you've got the shredding, all the '80s, all the all that kind of stuff. You were nailing it. You nailed it. I heard you through the wall. But oh yeah. wow! I changed my approach because I had learned that stuff, but I'm not, I'm not as good at it as you are. I, I, you know, but I, I know that Alice was also to eat to uh, sort of finish the equation of the band. If we're going to do a lot of classic original band stuff, he'd need that classic sound as well. So I changed my approach to the audition and did just more focused more on the chords and you know maybe a little bit of soul in 18 and billion dollar babies those classic songs yeah and then i kind of said maybe this guitar will you know will sort of catch his eye and it was that silver uh, it was a gold sparkle i remember it was the gold sparkle guitar i took to the audition what was the name of those guitars the roxy that was my that was my first uh oh, that was, that was called the gmp yeah was that right, my GMP, GMP. GMP Roxy. So, so, um, luckily as fate had it, I mean, you filled that one role. I filled the other and, you know, Paul Taylor was our lukewarm water. We loved Paul yeah, Taylor because yeah, he, yeah, yeah. he filled it out. And then, then we, did you, did you know this or not? Do you remember this? Todd Jensen wasn't supposed to be the bass player on that first 96 tour. It was supposed to be Greg Smith. Oh, wow. And then while we were in Mexico, Greg Smith and something happened where next thing I got a call from Toby Mamis. He's saying, Oh yeah, there's a new guy coming down. His name's Todd Jensen. He's going to mm -hmm. be the bass player. He's really got, he got highly credentialed. And of course, Todd Jensen just ended up becoming, you know, Todd Jensen, man. Yeah. I, he, he's the reason him and the Scorpions are the reason why I lost 
50 percent of my hearing on that first tour because it was playing him and his two eight ten cab cabinet and pegs always cranked every night next to him and then the side feels coming from my guitar because i wanted to hear myself and then you with a snake is that is that the only picture that we have from 1996 vic is that the only picture that you have of reb i love it that did you ever hear my snake story what's the snake story um we were playing at the house of blues uh in uh west hollywood and um so alice brings a snake out and I'm watching Alice, you know, and something comes out of the snake. It's like water. <laughs> and it's, it's like a fire hose. And I was at that show. You were there? I, was playing with Slash. I was playing with Slash at the time, and the whole band went down to the House of Blues to see that show. So I, I, I'm forgetting. Yeah, Ted Nugent was there. Or not Ted Nugent, but um, the other so guys. So you were there. on stage when, when the, the infamous snake shitting incident. It was like an egg. It looked like it was having birth. Like after it peed. He came, walked over to me, and this thing came out of its butt. It was like a giant oval egg, um, and it went boom onto my paddle board and exploded. They've been asking people to step back all night. Well, immediately, the entire audience stepped back like 20 feet um, because this smell, it smelled like a zoo like that hadn't been kept up for years. It was like the most overpowering, and this is how bad it was. I, my solo was coming up. And I asked my guitar tech, can you go out there and just wipe that shit off of my thing? And he said, I'll try it. He went out, he got some towels, and he went out there, and he went, <laughs> he threw up all the <laughs> on the board. Wow. That's how bad it was. So afterwards, I didn't even speak to anyone. I walked right out the door. I just right off the stage, right out the door. I, was I so think you should have spoken to your uh... – uh, pedal effects endorsers and thank them because I can't believe that it survived it a snake survived. shit. You know, it, it's amazing. It so horrible. You know, I mm. guess they do it every, like they poop every three months or something. So they have to be deep pooped. <laughs> <laughs> Pick the wrong thing. I'm sure how you do that. <laughs> well, the snake wrangler, someone messed up on the snake wrangling that night. I love it. Well, Hey man, um, <laughs> That story. We're going to see you out again, uh, definitely on the road sometime in 2023. Oh, I, want, I want to give the audience um, a chance to find out where you're going to be. You're going to be at this guitar clinic Tuesday, mm -hmm. February 7th. And um, again, all your social media, they want to find out about this guitar clinic and other stuff. Why don't you tell the people listening uh, on the audio broadcast how to get in touch with Reb Beach? Um, you know, the best way is... Uh official red beach at gmail.com that's my email for getting uh guitar lessons if you'd like a guitar lesson with me uh for an hour on skype uh shoot me an email at official red beach at gmail.com and i'll see if i can schedule you in uh you know and um you know on facebook of course there you go at red beach official on instagram go follow them now not just right now wait still at the end of the broadcast and then go find them and of course you're on Twitter. Oh, real Red Beach over there, the uh, the Twitter, I see. Um, again, we have a little bit of sad news coming out. I, I hate doing this every week. These last couple of weeks have been fucking brutal. But uh, we want to give a little bit of a salute and a shout out. And um, I'm not sure if you've ever done a any sort of sessions with these guys, but they have passed away this week. Um, salute to Mr. David Crosby and yeah. to Robbie Bachman as well. There's David Crosby and... Uh, Robbie Bachman, and of course, Lisa Marie Presley and Jeff Beck, who we're still um, paying tribute to. And it's been a crazy couple of weeks in, in the world of rock and roll. But, uh, you know, my um, my last sort of, uh, well, there you go, there's Robbie. Um, I do want to say about next week's guest, um, thank you very much for being on the program, by the way, Mr. Uh, Red right, Beach. Right, right. We will have a, um, you are a comedian, but we have an official rock and roll comedian. He says he loves you. He says he knows you. I talked to him yesterday. Don oh, right. Jameson will be our guest on next week's broadcast. Uh, that'll be January 27th. Uh, so check it out. Uh, do you know Don? I do, of course. Yeah, he's great and very funny. Very funny guy. Good. Yeah. Well, you've been around a lot, Mr. Reb. You've played with a lot of bands. We talked about them a lot on this episode in 
if you guys would like to catch up on any of the other stuff, uh, Federico will be putting out some clips this week or just go watch the entire episode, if you will. Thanks again uh, to Vic Chalfont for doing a great job putting up the pictures and uh, tracking down all the uh, – information for this week's episode but most of all thanks to everybody in the rga and all the new red beach fans that are out there that have joined us on our podcast thank you so much for being a part of it again if you're just filling in joining in uh, catching this part hit that subscribe button and that like button it really helps us with the youtube algorithm so we can get a lot of eyeballs on this episode and the channel in general that's at ryan roxy official um like I said, next week, Don Jameson, um, I go out always uh, asking the guests saying, do you have any sort of advice, life advice that you uh, have lived by? Maybe some advice that your amazing father gave you or some, someone along the route has given you that has helped you out through life that you can pass on to our listeners. I would say, um, you know, just you could, you could just, get hit by a bus, <laughs> you know, so I live life to the fullest, uh, save your money. If you can and put money aside just from every paycheck, just so that you have something to retire on. Um, and, uh, in, enjoy the music pursue, just go for it. You know, you have to just go for it. Uh, and, uh, and screw everyone else. It's, it's all about you. <laughs> For life, <laughs> I got my sound bites. I got Red Beach Winger recorded every record stone and uh, Red Beach. Screw everybody. <laughs> Think about yourself first, man. When when it comes to your life, you what know you what, want? Red? You've been an amazing band member, and I can tell you can tell that because of the amount of bands that you've been in and the longevity of those bands and the friendships in those bands. We're still buds, and I can hardly wait to see you somewhere out there on the road. Uh, best of luck with everything. Hopefully, we'll be sharing the same stage at one point soon. Sure and uh, thanks for coming on the podcast, buddy. And thanks for having me. Really, everybody, fun. thank you for being a part of the uh, Big Rock Show, and we'll see you next time on In the Trenches. I'm Ryan Roxy. Until next time, enjoy the ride. See you, folks. Bye. Trenches with Ryan Roxy.